That's right, right. Well, I'm short, but I'm introducing, so there you go. How do you get the measure of someone? What was their number one thing? You can read the stuff they write. We look at a lot of the stuff that Sverdrup wrote. And yet at the same time, what's that, what's that say about the man behind this? I was going through his biography at one point, and one thing stood out. It was kind of in the backwater part of it. You know, once you pass 200 in a biography, unless it's like on Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> you're really in the back alley stuff that people are going to just skim past. But something stood out and said this much, looking back on Spurgeon's life, because Helen knew Spurgeon. Rightly understood, it may be said that one of Professor Spurgeon's most undaunting traits was his spirit of freedom. He was, in an eminent degree, a free man. To him, true freedom consisted in being in harmony with God, and he recognized fully that only that person is truly free whom the Son of God has made free. At the center of his life, it was about freedom, and that's, that's that free and living congregation and that living faith being set free, first and foremost, by the gospel, set, uh, set free by Jesus. Helen continued on, it was no boast to him, nor was it an expression of proud feeling of perfection when he once in his later years said, I have made up my mind about one thing. Whatever happens to me, I want to be in the right relationship to God. I look over everything that this man did, and you, you spend enough time looking at what he did, you'll feel either humbled or guilty, depending upon you know where your conscience is. Because the man was, was manic for the amount of things he did for the kingdom of God. But what was his number one part of that number one thing? Whatever happens to me, I want to be in the right relationship to God. May that be said of all of us. It's also one of the great connections, one of those great things that we share in common with him. And that makes all of this somewhat more relatable than it already was. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the witness of the past of faithful men who have stood for you. Lord, we thank you that we can gather, first of all, in your name, celebrating the goodness that you have done throughout history for all of humanity. Lord, we thank you for the good that you have done through this man and his witness and through those around him. Thank you for a godly heritage. Lord, we know that a godly heritage only goes as far as we're willing to go with it. So we pray that you would carry us along by your spirit as well. That we may continue to serve in a similar sort of a way. First and foremost, wanting to be right with you, to walk with you, and to enjoy being free in you from now into eternity. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Hooper. 
Next, we're pleased to welcome again for the Spirit of Song Fest our Pastor Robert Lee, who's done this for us many times before, and accompanied by Marion Christophe. Describes him as similar to the Wesleys, uh, writing out of that kind of a, a situation and, and struggle. Aside from his Christmas hymns, say both authors that I consulted, um, are his revival hymns. Perhaps someone says <coughs> the greatest of his hymns. And O oh Father, may thy word prevail is recognized as one of those revival hymns, all written, by the way, within a four-year period. He recognized that a child of God must not expect to escape the trials of life. We have existence, or excuse me, assistance, but not exemption. And so his hymn, I Walk in Danger All, of, all the Way, talks about the struggle in the life of a believer way too. Uh, he became a bishop when Denmark had a king who was strongly influenced by the pietist movement uh, and he would continue on in that. Starting to see toward the end of his time, he died at age 70, uh, a little beginning of rationalism coming in, coming into the church and uh, uh, both Auberg and Smith kind of blame that on pietism. They said too much emphasis on life, not enough emphasis on doctrine. But uh, I, I don't know if we're in a position to judge on that one. One of his sons published his swan song after his death. And that includes the uh, Blorsen hymn that I discover most people aren't familiar with at all. 
except those that have gone to Norwegian American funerals. Uh, behold a host arrayed in white. <coughs> and that is uh, one of Brorson's hymns. Uh, I had a pastor some years ago who called me up, I, uh, who, a pastor who was disgustingly young. And he said, there's someone in his congregation who wants uh, a hymn, a certain song at his funeral. He said, uh, something about a great white host. And I said, isn't that sung regularly at funerals in your church? <coughs> Never heard of it. So that has passed on to like that, except for Loyal, who's planning to have it as his funeral. <laughs> if, he can, if he can still find somebody who can sing it. <laughs> We wonder how some of this uh, relates to us in the discussion of baptismal evangel evangelizing of the baptized. Uh, is Carl Wagner here? I think he, he was going to be, but he's at his, I don't know, at his some, anniversary up in uh, Lutzen. Right? Carl and I took a course together uh, one summer, a graduate course at Lutzen Seminary. And uh, I think he might remember this also. I used the phrase in discussion, the evangelization of the baptized. And one pastor went ballistic, <laughs> literally ballistic, uh, just shaking. And he said, uh, there is no such thing. He said, to be baptized is to be evangelized. That's it. There's nothing else, no more. And our teacher, Dr. Scott Heinrich, Hendricks, uh, said, well, he said, I think Luther would agree with Bob. <laughs> I was glad to find Luther in agreement with me. Uh, I would agree that our father, forefathers and foremothers in the AFLC uh, were of the conviction that most people did not remain in their covenant of baptism. I believe that that was the conviction of which I became aware, and that evangelization of the baptized was very necessary. Uh, I remember talking to Pastor Strand about it once, and he said, well, the one of his past, one of our pastors that he recalls, he said, uh, he would speak of having remained in his baptismal covenant. But he said, not me. And he said, not for most of us. And he mentioned his own, in his vita, his own conversion experience of all things through a radio preacher back on the farm in North Dakota. And it was under the influence of that radio preacher that he came to assurance of salvation and new life in Jesus Christ. To be faithful to our heritage, uh, we want to avoid a wrong emphasis on what sometimes is called a word and sacrament ministry, but a word and sacrament ministry that fails to recognize the need for the evangelizing of the baptized is false. And, and we want to stand there uh, firmly as we press on into the future. Our first hymn then is the one that from which Brian quoted, Ach, Vater, La Dit Ord. We're going to sing it first in English and then sing the one Norwegian verse that we have in our program. Is that how we should do it? With it? Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> So 
against him for whatever reason, Brian Davidson, uh, was uh, excluded from the ambassador <laughs> when we transferred over from the Concordia. Probably because it was so seldom so. Probably. Probably so. <laughs> we will uh, blame you and Tom. We didn't get a vote. Our, our second hymn is so different, you know, the spirit of it in that way, isn't it? And it's one of the first ones that Brooks wrote, by little ones, dear Lord, are we.
Society is and what we have been up to over the last 20 years of our history. So at this time I'll invite uh, Loyal Dyrud and Marty Horn to come up and tell us a little bit about the Spurgeon Society. <laughs> For my funeral, then stone will be the foot would be there. But nevertheless, I will say this: one of the first pastors I remember growing up in the country church in Saddestown was Reverend Silas Erickson, and he was an enormous man. He was about six four, six three, two hundred some pounds, and he would sing. He had a marvelous voice, and he would sing that song over and over. Then stone will be the foot, and in fact, it got so common up there that they used to refer to Silas Erickson as then stole her leader pluck, had on Kuhlman, you know? And so he was just called the, the big white host because he was such a big <laughs> And so by associate, so, so Pastor Lee, you were pretty accurate on that at some point. Well, uh, how did the Sphere of Society begin? About uh, the last 20 years, 
but it goes back before that. In 1995, it was at the ARC for the annual conference. And I was, uh, Mary and I were there, and we were staying, I don't even remember the name of the dormitory or whatever it was, but there was an upstairs room, and there you could gather after hours. And there I ran into this man and the bedroom. And Rennie and Marlon Bedroom were up there, and Marty knew them, and he was talking with them, and I'd sit in there and listen pretty soon. Marty made a comment to me, well, you've been at Oxford, you should know this. I didn't know anything. They were talking about that 1890s rift between the Norwegian Synod, the St. Olaf group, and Oxford, and Sverdrup. I didn't know a thing about this. And I felt like two cents listening to them. And Marlon said, well, you should know that. You, you were there. Well, I remember the names. They were, <laughs> they were on buildings, but I wasn't quite that old then. But nevertheless, there were names all over the buildings, but I didn't know anything about the history of it. And I was really embarrassed. But anyway, that's when I got to begin my journey on Sverdrup, and uh, largely due to Pastor Horn. So we're going to let him begin with his uh, explanation of it. But. OK. Loyal is asking just to give a little bit of this is more personal than anything else. How did I get interested in the Sverdrup theology and Sverdrup's writings? It began in seminary, was lectured by Pastor Lee. I'm very, very grateful for those lectures. And then at my ordination, he gave me a copy, and I'm going to get the book right here. I left it. And the reason I have to get the copy is I forgot the title of the book. There it is. <laughs> Getting the title of The Heritage of Faith, translations of uh, curated translations of some of Sverdrup's writings. And I started reading that and marking it up. It had answered some questions, but more questions arose. And I wanted to find more and more of this man's writings. And so I started looking and digging and prying out of books, and I started to collate as much of his writing as I could find in English. The problem is that it wasn't very much. In the early 90s, there were some issues in the association, and the question in my mind that arose from those issues was, what is the Association of Free Lutheran Churches supposed to be? What is our real core beliefs? How do we handle things? What is this supposed to be all about? At the same time, my father, who was a Norwegian immigrant and was semi-retired from farming, but I think that if you know farmers, that never ever works. Uh, it meant that he was putting in 50 hours instead of 70 hours a week. Needed something to do, and someone had given him a six volume set of Sverdrup's works and so we worked it out that he would translate an article into a, a rough translation of Norwegian, and then we would get together and edit it together and talk about what was in that text. And that was the most fun time I had with my father, probably throughout my entire life. There were a lot of other memories I have, but I really, really enjoyed that. I became convinced that the remainder of Sverdrup's writings were invaluable and were a rich resource of theology that needed to be translated into, the, into English. And if it wasn't done, it probably would be left inaccessible to American Lutherans. And that was basically my introduction, and then I come to Loyal. I, I'd like to close with this thought here. Over the years, I thought that the center of Sverdrup's thought was his congregational polity, what it meant to be a free church. But what I've discovered is that the real center of his theology was a gospel-based, robust theology of the congregation. What is the congregation in scripture? And, and from that is free church polity is derived. Loyal, back to you.
So, uh, as I said, I was really embarrassed. I went home and I started to every, read every book I could on Sverdrup. And I started off reading Andreas Hellout's Georg Sverdrup, The Man and His Message, and that was quite wonderful. And then I read Feeble's The Lutheran Free Church, and I couldn't believe it. And then Pastor Lee, I was talking with him about this, and he brought up the fact that, well, have you read Hamry's Georg Sverdrup, uh, Educator, Theologian, Churchman? No, I hadn't. And so I got that one, and then everything I could, I would try to read. And I was so amazed that I had missed all this. I grew up with the LFT. I didn't know anything about it. And we, uh, we didn't know anything, you know, we knew Sverdrup just by name. Well then, Marty and I had the opportunity to work together on Parish Head. So in, in uh, 1999, he was at, at Boston, and I was in Thief River, so we would drive together down to these meetings. What an education that was, to listen to him discuss Sverdrup, and we'd back and forth. We'd get down to the meetings, we'd have the meetings all day, they would stay in a hotel room, and then we'd keep talking, and keep going, and going, and going. And Marty would often say, Loyal, it's two o'clock in the morning now, we've got to get some sleep for the meeting tomorrow. And so that's the way we went all the way back up north again, in the same situation. So I was, for years and years and years, and here are some of the points and questions we were, you know, pondering. Number one, we always seem to know what we are against in the AFLC, but what really are we for? And two, how many generations can an institution continue on in what it opposes without knowing what it was for? And that became quite alarming. And then the last one, finally, well, what were the founders, Spirit of an Up to Down, trying to do and trying to say? And that's perhaps the most important. So, when you look at it in 1963, at the time of the merger, of the 2,600 pages that Sverdrup had written in its Sarmat is good at that, how many do you suppose were available to the English reading public? Less than 100. So what, you know, how on earth, what, what do you expect? Nobody knew who he was. And so, um, and then my, pa <laughs> I, at the time my pastor was Pastor Terry Olson. And I would talk to him about the discussions Marty and I were having and say, oh, that really is a, a problem, all right. And he had read that uh, heritage of faith. And he said, you know, when I was in seminary, I read that, it was on the bookshelf, and I couldn't kind of, I couldn't believe what it was. And then he said, you know, I, I've come to the conclusion that understanding the polity of the AFLC and the LFC is kind of like grabbing a hold of a greased pig. Just when you think you got it, it squirts away. Then, then where are we? What's going on here? And I couldn't quite. I could, and, and I love that analogy because that's certainly right. I was right in the middle of trying to figure this out as, as much as I could. And then, you know, between 1963 and when the Sverdrup Society was formed, there were about 400 pages that were translated of the 2,600. One of that, that's 136. Uh, Dr. James Hamry did for his PhD dissertation at Iowa, translated 200, about 50 pages. And that's a marvelous, and Marty got tracked him down and found out who he was. And then we started to talk more and more so that by 2003 we decided, okay, we've got to get, something's got to be done here. And these were the conclusions. How do we get Sverdrup translated into English? So we need a host of translators. Uh, how do we get the word out to the April C congregations about Sverdrup's concept of the Lutheran biblical uh, congregationalism? We needed to have regional meetings to get to the congregations and talk about it. And, uh, and then we needed to have an annual meeting in the seminary. And this turned out to be in January where the seminarians could hear papers presented and discussed there. And then finally, the third point was, well then how do we get these translations and papers kept somewhere where people could read them? We have to have a journal. It's got to be a journal that is printed annually. And so then on December 3rd, we gathered, I mean December 2003, I should say, we gathered at the Radisson Hotel in Fargo and we uh, organized the uh, Sort of Society. And of the first board members were Tim Burnson, myself, Marty Horn, Rainer Chuglin, or Reverend Rainer Chuglin, Reverend Marty Horn at the time, Reverend Robert Lee, Dr. Grant Munson, and uh, Reverend Terry Olson. And uh, I, I was president at the time, Marty was the secretary, uh, 
Pastor Lee was the editor, the first editor, and uh, Dr. Munset was the vice president and Terry Olson was the treasurer. And Kermit Nash did all the uh, legal work pro bono to get us uh, organized as a corporation. And so that, and then since then we've had some marvelous translators. And I, I, can't, I can't get over uh, Larry Walker who has been the editor for 19 years and is the key translator, translated more pages than I think anybody else in the journal. And then uh, Rainer Schublin translated everything until about three years ago. He said, I, at the age of 95, I'm old enough now, so I just don't feel like I should be translating anymore. So he bowed out. But every journal up until then, he had a piece of translation. And Carl Bognes has done a marvelous job for us. I just wish he were here right now. And then, of course, now recently, Brian Lund is, is uh, trying to catch up with some of these first guys that were translated like crazy. And he's doing a fine job as well. And we've got, we owe so much to these translators, and there's so many of them. So we have a dream in the AFLC, I mean, in the, and it's about the AFLC, but we have a dream about the Sverdrup Society in Sverdrup, that someday Jörg Sverdrup's name will be as well known in the AFLC as CFW Walters is in the Missouri Center. <laughs> now, by that, I don't mean that we are going to sit here and worship the man and make all kinds of busts. You see them in Oxford. But we were not talking about worshiping the man as a man but rather about revering his theology of the congregation so that one day all our congregations in the AFLC would understand Sverdrup's view of the congregation. And that's a dream well worth having. So that's 20 years and we want to thank you for, for all the work that's been done in that 20 year period. Today is Dr. Stanley Kondek. He wrote a paper for our most recent journal about medical missions in uh, both before his time with Dr. John Dearness and then also his own experience in Madagascar. But he was unable to present for us in person at our January seminary event because he was in Madagascar <laughs> accepting an award uh, posthumously on behalf of his wife for a book that she wrote about, uh, or was it the oral histories one that received the award? And we're, and on that account, we're very happy and thankful to welcome him today to share with us in person about Madagascar medical missions, the rest of the story. So welcome Dr. Stanley Clark. Or sit for your presentation. No, no. I don't. According to the schedule, I have 23 minutes. <laughs> you can go as long as you need to. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. And uh, I would say it's fortunate 
for you that that is the case because doctors are not known for talking loud. <laughs> this one. There is a Malagasy tradition that I learned, I was taught, when I gave my first Malagasy speech. My co colleague said to me, now, when you give up a talk, you have to apologize. Really, I said, I've got many things I can apologize for, but what do you mean? <laughs> and the tradition is that the speaker, when he's in front of the audience, he apologizes for having the audacity to stand here and speak to those who are older and wiser than I. <laughs> well, I'm 86 years old. <laughs> and I imagine there are some here that are older than I, but probably not that many. And I, but there are plenty that are wiser than I. I had intended to include here Carl Bognes, because he is older than I. He is 95 years old, and I had expected him to be here, but he sent a message yesterday saying that he's celebrating his 73rd anniversary. Carl Bognes and I formed the nucleus of Lutheran Free Church kids at that time. Carl with his brother Morris and I with my sister Hortense, we were it. We were all the L of Sears kids that were there at that time. And Carl started at the American School in 1936 and his, his brother Morris started in 1937. <coughs> and my sister started in 1941. And I started in 1943. Those days, 1941 and 1943, for all of us who know history well, that was World War II. And I have a lot that I could say about that but at this point, I want to stop and mention that more than anyone else, my cousins and I are probably the only ones here who are here because of a direct, indirect, historical connection with Georg Sverdrup. Because it was Georg Sverdrup who sent our grandfather to Madagascar, to Manashua, our grandma and Anna Loni were sent by Georg Sverdrup to Manashua. And there, over the next seven years, they had four children. And two of them, the youngest two, the youngest was my mother Connie, and the next oldest was Hannah. And she is the mother of my cousins here right now. Arnie Sather and Sonia Sather. We, though we live far apart, We were emotionally close because our mothers were very close. And it was Arnie who his spiritual experience when he had been confirmed that embedded in me the thought that even I, who was a third generation missionary kid, I hadn't really thought of becoming a missionary myself. That was for somebody other than me. But Arnie's experience 
conclude the end that, well, maybe I could also. I've written about that in the book. And it was he. wife to whom I was married for almost 60 years, who passed away a year and a half ago. But then I want to go on and say it was in 1973 when we came home on Pearl. We had four children at that time and the youngest were twins. And it was Sonia who welcomed us into her heart, people. Sonia right there. And one of the twins is right here now. That's Lily. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry I get kind of emotional. The news that we read about and see in the TV these days is tragedy upon tragedy. About the Israelis fighting Hamas in Israel. I happen to have a very close relationship with the Jews. Partly because my son worked in Israel for a number of years with the American Embassy. So we would visit Israel from time to time. But this war is sometimes called the Second Yom Kippur War, after the 1973 Yom Kippur War. I had a Yom Kippur moment myself. And I don't think you have very many medical doctors speaking to you, so I will bring up some experiences of medical school. I should mention here that before me is another medical doctor, though. And this is Richard Roach right here. who actually was my medical student at one time. But uh, then he went on and uh, got his MD and went on to uh, residency in internal medicine. Then he became a professor of internal medicine at a medical school in Michigan. And from there, he would bring residents to Madagascar uh, on a yearly basis. Some of his uh, internal medicine residents to uh, experience some some uh, experience experience some some tropical medicine uh, work. And then at that time, then he would also be teaching our doctors within the SOFA system. Drink of water, please. And that is Dr. Richard Roach here. Let me tell you about my Yom Kippur moment. As a freshman at the University of Chicago Medical School, we had gross anatomy. And that gross anatomy we were four students lined up at one uh, dissection board uh, table. We had a cadaver that we were to dissect, two on each side. One day I showed up 
And I was the only one of four that showed up at this dissection table. And I asked around, well, where are my partners? And they said, oh, it's Yom Kippur today. And I said, Yom Kippur who? <laughs> <laughs> and they went on and explained to me the Yom Kippur <coughs> was a big, big, big Jewish holiday. And it was the Day of Atonement. And that it was a day of fasting. And it was not a day to be skipped for the, for the observant Jews in this country. That was my first exposure to any Jew. I came from Augsburg. <laughs> there weren't any Jews at Augsburg. <laughs> now I ended up at the University of Chicago Medical School. <coughs> and three of my partners were Jewish. We were lined up at, at the table alphabetically. <coughs> <Two>. <coughs> Thank you, daughter. We were lined up alphabetically. Q, me, R, Rothman, S, Shapiro, S, Silverman. No wonder. There were good, three were Jews. I soon learned that half my class were Jewish, which was okay with me. I appreciated them. They were smart and diligent. And they, and that's why, and very compulsive. And that's why Jewish doctors these days probably make the best doctors because they're so compulsive. Dr. Roach, would you agree? <laughs> My best friends are all Jewish in college. So this is this is a, a, a real tragedy that's going on because because of our experience of living in Israel and of all the Jews that we know. In fact, I have a good Jewish friend. He's an anthropologist. He was a professor of anthropology in several of the universities around. And when this broke just the other day, I sent him an email, sent them, because I know his wife also. And I expressed my concern and that I, as a Christian, would be praying for them. My subject matter of today was and is to comment on the Madagascar Medical Missions, the article that Loyal Dyrid asked me to write, which we finally concluded with 13 iterations. When Loyal Dyrid was, was finally content with what I was writing. And that is published in the journal of this year. And in that book, in that article, we try to relate how it was labeled York Sverdrup and the Ministry of Mercy, Madagascar Medical Missionaries. And of course, it started off with Dr. Dearness. And then it, it picked up with the role that Dr. Dearness played in promoting medical work, not only in the Southwest Madagascar, but throughout even, even the Southeast Madagascar. And then 
then when Kathy and I stepped into that role to to take over, to take some, to, to lead the, the, the medical work, uh, and then we, the article also elaborates the work that we did. The, uh, the book, so I'm not going to speak any more about that because it's, it's in the journal of this year. But now I would like to speak about the book that Kathy and I started 10 years ago. This is the, a draft here. And this here book is in fact the book that my wife wrote. And this was the reason why I wasn't here in January was because that book was being inducted into the Malagasy Academy of Literature. And that was the reason why my cousin Marion read it for me. But it's available now in the book, in the journal, so I'm not gonna go any further. But I do want to comment on these hymnals here. The musician here, are you familiar with this kind of hymn? It would be difficult to read, but. <laughs> what do you call that? What kind of what kind of music notation is that? I think it's like serenade. Is it serenade? <coughs> <laughs> <coughs> the story on this is that it's called the Curin, C-U-R-E-N, soul cloud music. And the reason I'm bringing it up here is because my mother was a musician, a pianist. She could play Bach and Beethoven and Haydn and whatever. So when she came to Madagascar in 1928, she expected to be playing the Malagasy hymns. The Malagasy hymns were presented to her like this. <laughs> and she said, what's that? I can't think of that. <laughs> and she took it upon herself to transpose all the Lutheran hymns, Malagasy hymns, from this to music notes. And when she died in 1978, my father and I decided that as a memorial, we would get her handwritten transposed notes into a printed form. But it took me 30 years to find anyone who could do it. And that was somebody in Madagascar who knew computers and knew notes, and he was able to transpose from the sofa into music notes. However, all the Protestant hymns, all the Protestant churches in Madagascar do not use notes. They use this so far. And I, we were told that. They said there probably isn't going to be much demand for it. <laughs> but we said, well, we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> so we printed 500 copies of them. <laughs> and I frankly don't know how many have been sold. But all the churches, Protestant churches in Madagascar use this current soul prop. And that was taught by the London Mission Society missionary James Richardson in about 1887. And he, he realized that the Malagasy have a, a talent to talent for music. They could pick up music and start singing and singing. And that's what they did. And as a result, all the Protestant churches of Madagascar still use this so far, and they will continue to use it. I say all the Protestants, because Lutherans may make up the majority of the Protestants, but also the Reformed Church is also very significant. And they make up the other half of the Protestants in Madagascar. And 
at the time of the induction of my wife's book, my mother's book was inducted into the academy as well. So that was two convict women who were noted. As my cousin Mary would often say, well, the convict women can get a lot done, but we convict men, all we do is sit in a corner and read a book. <laughs> <laughs> Doyle and I have had a friendship that goes back for many years. And because we have had an interest in the Lutheran Free Church, because I come out of the Lutheran Free Church. My whole family comes out of the Lutheran Free Church. And at the time that I was being in medical school, and I heard from the office of the foreign mission of the Lutheran Free Church that another hospital was being built in Madagascar. And they had, they had me in their sights as being a doctor for this place. And I wasn't fully aware of all this, but somewhat. But anyhow, they, they contributed, they, they gave scholarship for me and uh, which was indeed very helpful. So I, as far as I knew, I was Lutheran Free Church. But then when the time came to be called as a missionary, by this time it was ALC. So it was the ALC that called me as a missionary. And it was the, it was the office of the Lutheran Church Foreign Mission Board that said, okay, you are now going to be commissioned in such and such a church, which apparently was an ALC church. That's how I went from Lutheran Free Church to ALC. I see in the background here a very important fellow who knows all about this as well. And that's Claire Stoley. Claire Stoley is basically Lutheran Free Church too, from Kenyon, Minnesota. He has been very, very instrumental in the development of the work that we did in Madagascar, in the development of Sulfur. Now let me tell you a bit about the book that, that my wife and I started. So 10 years ago when we wrote the preface. And I'm just gonna read the last paragraph of the preface that we wrote. Kathy and I hope that through our family history and the stories that are intertwined with it, the reader will come to see that we do not view all that has happened as being our work, but rather the work of the Holy Spirit working through us and also through the brilliant, devout Malagashi with whom we have walked side by side all these 40 plus years. That work is continuing now, even now without us or any of our kin. And that is part of the story, too, to show how God's work continues, led by the Holy Spirit, working through capable Malagasy professionals. This is what makes up the rest of the story. Though the story is told here through our own personal lens, we trust that our own part in the story will be minimized, and that the part of the Malagasy and that of the Holy Spirit working through them will be magnified. To God alone be the glory. This, the manuscript of the book that we've written is, as you can see, it's very dense. Or it's 
400 pages. 200 pages deal with the main story and 200 pages are appendix. For example, in the appendix is a story that Lily wrote about climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Is that of an interest to anybody here? Anybody know who Mount Kilimanjaro is? It's one of the tallest mountains in Africa, 19,000 feet. And climbing it is not a walk in the park. So she and her friends set out to climb it, and she wrote a detailed description of how they, what they encountered on the trip. And it's interesting for some people, for young people, I'm sure. And then there in the appendix as well, there is an article written by my son when he and I took a bicycle trip from Port Dolphin all the way to the capital city of Antananarivo, which also was not a walk in the park. <laughs> but I, we have in the book, when Kathy died, she, she was, <coughs> she was smart, and she, oh, she was a writer. She wrote her own book without any help, and she knew grammar. But then, when I took over after she died, well, I'm not a writer, and I don't know grammar. English was my worst class in, in high school. I barely, barely got through that in college. So that was what I ended up with. But I got some contributing editors who were very good. And one of the contributing editors is Professor Jim Vegan, who worked with us in Madagascar for a number of years, but he, he's a theologian and a church historian and wrote his dissertation for his doctor's degree on the first American missionary that Georg Sverdrup sent to Madagascar, and that was John Hoekstra. The second one, that Hochstadt sent to Madagascar was Eric Tau. And in the book, we've written quite a bit about him. And Vegan took some of the, my, re, my writing in the first chapters and rewrote them and did it and, and wrote it correctly. So don't worry, at least those chapters are correct. Another one who has contributed is a, another colleague from Madagascar who worked with us in the, in the medical sector. His name, was, his name is Lon Keitlinger. He came as a medical technician. And then he went on and got his doctorate in public health but doing studies of uh, public health studies in the Ranamathana area of Madagascar. And then after that, he retired from the mission and became commissioner of health for South Dakota. And after that, he retired and entered the Peace Corps as a volunteer and went back to Madagascar. And there he picked up the work that he had started 40 years before in terms of the statistics on the, on the development of health care among women and children. And so his statistics are also published in the book. Another of the contributing editors is Carl Eggert. who came to us to do field study for his research 
as, as an anthropologist. He was assigned <laughs> in a village 20 kilometers from where we were in our, in our mission hospital in Zadov. And there he embedded himself into the culture of those people. Now, uh, as, a, as a typical anthropologist, when he came to us, he let us know that the work that we're doing, the evangelistic branch of our work, was not good. You're spoiling the culture of these people. You shouldn't be doing that. That was his initial impression. After staying there two years and learning what was going on and having gotten ill, very ill, a number of times where he had to come to our hospital and he'd get saved, he's kind of changed his perspective <laughs> in reception to the <laughs> Nevertheless, I appreciated his comments when he read my manuscript. He said, Stan, you have to clean up your vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> you have to make it sound more scientific. For example, you cannot use the word pagan. <laughs> because that implies you are looking or talking about a group of people who are lesser than you. Okay. Okay, Carl, what's next? And then he said, you shouldn't use the term witch doctor. Because in my writing, I had used the term witch doctor describing what he does when he encounters a patient seeking help from him. And as he moves his his uh, seeds around on the, on the, on the mat, and then he, he designs what the treatment is. And for us, we always assumed that he was actively deceiving the, the, the patient. No, Carl says, you're wrong. He says, I have witnessed in person many of these and he said, don't use the term witch doctor, use the term they use themselves, which is Umbiasha. Okay, I'll use Umbiasha. And, and he says, I have witnessed in person what these Umbiasha can do and do. And I have found them to be sincere in their work. And they're not attempting to deceive their, their, their patients. Well, I find that very interesting because he lived with them. He attended their, their ceremonies. When we missionaries lived there, we were not embedded in their culture. We lived apart. We were embedded in the Christian culture. And frankly, in my 40 years in Madagascar, I never saw real case of an Umbiyasha doing his kind of work, that kind of work. I've seen imitations of that. In fact, we produced a video on the treatment of tuberculosis, and the person who managed the video, he wanted to show exactly what the Umbiyasha was doing. And it, I think it was an accurate description that he portrayed, because the one who was portraying it was a former Umbiyasha. And that, on the video, he is dressed with his charms, sitting on a mat, and he's got uh, the charms with a big horn on his breastplate. And then he rings a bell, and he prays, and then he goes moving things around, and he says, okay, this is what you have to do. 
for treating your tuberculosis, you have to sacrifice a black bull. And this kind of thing, on and on. And for us, it was totally deceiving. And many of these would come to us later, having spent all their money on cattle that they have sacrificed to these umbiasha, to try to get healed from the disease that affected them. Now they've run out of their assets, because their assets are cattle. They've come to us looking for treatment. And they were telling us that. Well, we don't have anything more. We spent it all on doing the ocean. So, but we treated them. Of course we did. And mostly, most of the time, we were successful because we used modern medicine. Because tuberculosis, <clears throat> these days, is in fact treatable. And also leprosy. Uh, leprosy, when we were given the responsibility to manage the medical centers of the Lutheran Church, we were instructed by the leaders of the church to also look into and take care of the leprosarium that were in existence at that time. Now, we American Lutherans didn't have any, but the Norwegian Lutherans had two large leprosy, leprosoriums. One historically was the largest leprosorium in the world with 900 patients at one time. But by the time we got into the picture, it had sizzled, sizzled down to about nothing. But the other one was quite significant and was very active because they would send scouts out into the, into the country and look for potential leprosy patients and bring them in and treat them because leprosy these days is also treatable, which is very significant if you have leprosy. And in the second leprosarium that we were talking about, uh, they were treating quite a number of active leprosy patients most of them were no, no longer active. Now, my friend, Dr. Roach here, he could give you a full background on leprosy. And I, 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 know, I know enough, Richard, that the, the name of the bacteria is Mycobacterium leprae, right? right? And the name of the bacteria for TB is Leputno. What is it? Same family. As Same that. family. That's why they're so, both diff they're very difficult to treat. The story is that in 1978, because of the Marxist Socialist Revolution, things became very difficult for us Americans in the medical world, <coughs> and we in the medical world. The, the rebellion broke out right in our, right where we were in the Southwest. And the leader of the rebellion was a guy by the name of Wunzadona, who actually was a former student of one of our Bible schools. But he had taken to heart what the, what the missionary had taught him. He said, you should, you are independent. Make your decisions yourself. Don't let yourself be controlled by the French. Ooh. <laughs> well, that kind of caused problems. Anyway, he started the rebellion there. One night, they attacked our, our little town. I showed up for chapel in, in the morning, and the nurses came up to me and, and said, well, did you hear we were attacked last night? I said, no. Yeah, they, they came in, and uh, they came up to the, the gendarmerie and tried to raid them for their guns. 
the gendarmes fired two shots in the air and they all took off. <laughs> but that was at Ezeda. In some of the other places, it was not that benign. <coughs> in uh, Bizan, for example, our missionary living there had to take cover under their beds because they, they were shooting across the yard. But that evolved. He was imprisoned for a while. And then when he was freed, he set up his office and base in Tuyar, which is the next largest city from Ezeda. And there he would write propaganda against the, the foreigners, the, against the Westerners, the French and the Americans. And of course in Southwest, I was the only American doctor there. So I had kind of a high profile. And since the, the Russians and the North Koreans and the Chinese were now in power, uh, these, the, the, the communists, my friend uh, Montezona uh, didn't like that this American was standing out. So he wrote articles against me, trying to get the government to kick me out. And in fact, one night they showed up at the wake that was held in the, in the village, whenever there was a patient that died, who died at the hospital. And my dear wife would often go to these wakes because they would sing Christian hymns, if they were Christian, they would sing Christian hymns all night long, Catholic hymns and Protestant hymns, and my wife would join them. On this particular occasion, they sidled up to my wife and said, you know those guys over there in the corner? They don't belong here. They come from the north. They come from the capital city and they're spies. They're here to see if they can get something on your husband. And hearing this, my wife broke out crying and went to the chaplain. And the chaplain stood up and said, if anybody got anything against Dr. Kwanzaa, come to me. Well, that was the end of that particular occasion. But as the years progressed, this was 1975 when the pro-French Siranana government was toppled by this Marxist socialist by the name of La Sirana. And the things, that's when things got bad. And most of the Americans had by now left Madagascar. And all my, my missionary peers had left about this time. And so Kathy and I decided, well, it's time for us to go too. Partly because there was no school for our older children because the, the schools that we had operated at the American school, the, over, the upper grades were closed because of, there weren't enough students. And now Glenn and Cindy were in, in seventh, uh, in eighth and seventh grade, so we needed a, a place for them to go, and there wasn't any place. So we had resigned. And the leaders of the Malagasy Church came down to Zeta, and they met in the church, and after the meeting, they called me in, and they said, we just appointed you director of the health department of the Malagasy Church, which you were to form and lead. And that's how we got into the Neprosorium situation, where we were now responsible for the Norwegian Neprosorium. The Norwegians had one large hospital in the north and one small <coughs> dispensary that we were responsible for, and then our own two American hospitals in the south. <coughs> also in my writing, I, I mentioned that I had had a spiritual awakening somewhere along the line here. After we became into that position. And my dear friend Carl Eggert, the Jew, 
He said, well, that's very interesting. I said, he said, can you please explain what that is? What kind of spiritual awakening did you have? Can you, can you write it out? Well, that, he wanted to make sure that I included that in the book, and rightly so. This is the same Jew to whom I sent the letter just the other day about I'm praying for you because of the anti-Semitism. <coughs> and what I've written here is personal awakening of the work of the Holy Spirit. Of course, as Lutherans, we refer to the Holy Spirit in the process of conversion because we believe that in baptism, we are instilled with the Holy Spirit who enables us to have faith and to believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Beyond that, though, the scientist in me found it hard to attribute much to the third person of the Trinity. Somehow, growing up as the son of two generations of missionaries in a country rich with spiritual awareness wasn't enough to awaken me to the power of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't until years in my own missionary service that I experienced my own awakening to the work of the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Malagasy spiritual worldview and the Malagasy awakening movement. And I am going to tell Carl that one would have to be spiritually completely dead if one did not respond to the following instances in my life. I was directed into medicine even after being told it was too difficult for me. I was accepted into the University of Chicago Medical School, which was in the top 10 at that time, and very difficult to get in, and, and, and it was private and very expensive. In spite of my MCAT, Tell you a little bit about that. <laughs> and the wife for whom I had been praying for years, and the call to form Leeds and to lead Sofa after resigning. These are the, the steps that I consider were definitely led by the Holy Spirit. And that Sofa developed into the second largest medical system in Madagascar. And even when I retired, there were 100 Malagasy doctors working in the system, and none of them had been recruited by me. I was the director, but I didn't recruit anything. They came to us looking for work. Whose work is that? That's the Holy Spirit leading them. Let me tell Richard Roach about my MCAT experience. <laughs> he knows more about it than I do. MCAT is something that all pre-med students have to take and pass, hopefully pass, if they expect to get into a medical school. Well, the way I got to <coughs> pre-med at Oxford was, well, I won't get into that. <laughs> but I, in the junior year, I was told that I had to take an MCAT exam. I said, oh, what's that? Well, the answer they told me. If you have to take that, I don't know if you get into medical school. So, I and the two other guys from Oxford went to the University of Minnesota, sat in this huge room where all the other medical students in the area were taking their MCAT exam. And of course, in those days, it wasn't computerized. It was, for me, it was multiple guests. And after the exam, I met to my friends and they said, well, what do you think of it? Think of it. I said, I didn't know a thing about it. <laughs> I guessed all the way through. <laughs> I had never taken a multiple of guess, multiple choice exam before. But I just came out of Madagascar. And most people who have taken an AMCAT, they live to find out what their grade was, right? People who come after come up after me and said, "Well, what did you get in your MCAT?" I said, "I have no idea what I got," <laughs> and I don't care. <laughs> I prayed that the Lord's will be done. In 
And so after this, we started looking around for medical schools to apply to. And I knew I didn't have much chance. So I was looking for the lowest fruit on, on, on the trees. And one of them was South Dakota, I thought, because they only had a future course at that time. So I applied to them. And one of the graduates from Oxford went to Tulane. So I applied there. And then the University of Minnesota. But my first cousin who lived in Sioux Falls, not a cousin on my mother's side, but a cousin on my father's side, on the Quantum side, I went down and talked to him. Because he was one year ahead of me. He had applied and had been accepted. And he said, Stan, why don't you apply to this medical school at the University of Chicago? He said, that's pretty good. I'd never heard of it. Never heard of the university. And so I did. I got the application forms. And I read through them. And I thought, oh my goodness, I don't even know what they're talking about. <coughs> So I applied. A couple weeks later, I, I got a letter from the dean of the medical school saying, you, you were requested to go for, a re for an interview at an alumnus at the, at Mayo, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. So I did. And after 30 minutes of friendly conversation with this guy, I still remember his name, his name is Dr. Johnson. And I thought, well, that's it. <coughs> but a couple of weeks later, I got a telegram for them from the dean of the medical school saying, you are accepted. <laughs> now, if that isn't the work of this person, <laughs> <coughs> totally unqualified. And that dean of the medical school, for some reason, he thought he liked students out of the box, I guess. And I was out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> because I, the scholarships that I did get were really, it didn't amount to that much. But he saw, too, that he could get scholarships in, in the university for me. So that I graduated from one of the most expensive private medical schools in the country <coughs> with no debt. Now, if that isn't a miracle, let me tell you one more medical school experience. Again, it was my freshman year, and this same dean called me into his office. I had gotten the notice, you are requested to report to the dean of the medical school. And I said, oh boy. <laughs> When you get that kind of a note, be ready to pack your bags. I knew that. So I, I, I over those next couple days, I was in profound depression. I thought, oh my goodness. It's, it's, uh, what am I gonna do? It's, a, well, it's an embarrassment, but it's an embarrassment for those who are supporting me. So I entered his office, and he said, Stan, sit down. I wanted to I talked to him because I wanted to talk to you about how you felt about the psychiatry courses you've been taking since you first started school here. I said, oh my goodness, yeah, I like them very much. He said, well, I knew you come from a very conservative Christian background, so I was concerned that you might not accept the psychiatry that is being taught. Oh, no, he said, I said, no, I, I very much appreciate it. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> Thank you, one and all, for being willing to listen to me. Thank you. by seminarian Alexander Grimes and accompanied again by Mary Christopherson. Alexander will be singing Jesus I Long for Thy Blessed Communion. Are you going to tell a little of the story yourself? 
Um, I was told a little bit about it, but okay. really amidst all my studies, it has kind of All right, so then I will happily tell some of the story. <laughs> so Hans Nielsen Hauge, uh, awakener of Norway, was singing this song behind his plow on uh, April of 1796 when he was awakened by the Holy Spirit and called to preach to his fellow Norwegians about forgiveness of sins and living for the Lord. So we'll do that song today. <coughs>
Mr. Larry Walker to come up and share a translation for us. Our theme for this upcoming year's journal is um, we're doing we're translating a lot of reports that Sturger wrote as the president of Oxford, and this is a segment from one of those reports. Thank you, Larry. Okay. Um, I'm going to read the whole report. I will try to get through it as fast as I can. I, the reason I'm doing the whole thing is because there is some mention of the Madagascar mission here. This is the report the professor that Sverdrup gave to the 1897 annual conference of the Lutheran Free Church. And this is actually the first report. It's a report of the seminary year. And it's the first report it gives where it's actually identified as saying, delivered to the Lutheran Free Church Conference. Before that, it had been the Friends of Augsburg Conference. And this was the year when uh, the United Church was suing the Lutheran Free Church to, uh, for, to, to take possession of Augsburg Seminary. So he, he speaks a lot about that, uh, 1897. For you have need of endurance, Hebrews 10.36. In all Christian labor, there are two things of equal importance that are necessary. One is, according to the prophet's words, not to despise the day of small things. The other is to hold out and not grow weary. The one who despises the baby in the crib will make no beginning on the way. And the one who does not endure the cross does not hold out until the end and does not achieve the crown. We have reached the point in the development of our seminary where it is of first importance to have that endurance which through labors and tribulations walks in a manly way forward toward that goal which is set by the calling. It is now as plain as day that the small beginning has vitality in it, nor is it denied by anyone who demands Christian insight and wisdom that Augsburg's principles for pastoral education are both true and healthy when judged according to God's word. It is just for that reason that the patience is required that perseveres and finishes the race in the course that has been begun. For the more our seminary truly achieves the mandate and confidence of Christians and gathers steadily more of those whose hearts the Lord has moved to it, the more important it is that the expectations which have been awakened not be disappointed. Many congregations have turned their thoughts and their minds to Augsburg Seminary as the place from which they would prefer to call their pastors in the future. And a multitude of young men are already so bound to the school that it will be a horrible disappointment to them if the school should either end or be abbreviated or pass into other hands therefore by being led onto other paths. And we are thinking in this connection not only of that host of youths whose names are already found in the school's books, but also of the many youths who with glad anticip anticipation look forward to the day when they too will be among the number of Augsburg students. Nor is it possible to overlook the fact that as Augsburg Seminary is the oldest Norwegian pastoral school in America, it has also, for all that time, exercised such a strong influence on the Norwegian seminaries that have since been established, serving in part as a model, in part as a not inconsiderable competitor. Should Augsburg go under or cease to work according to its peculiar principles, it would be to lose a significant factor in our entire ecclesiastical development. Therefore, endurance is a necessity just now, for it is far from the case that all those who are now influenced by Augsburg's principles and its work feel undivided joy and satisfaction under that influence. Many are those who feel Ill, an ill-conceived vexation that all pastoral education among our people is more or less influenced by Augsburg. Many, therefore, are those who desire that Augsburg must now be beaten down by its tribulations so that its work might be ended and other principles of pastoral education make themselves known. 
therefore endurance is needed. And now as the protracted and wicked legal case, which in its essence cannot be characterized as anything else but a persecution, threatens to suck the strength from the school, rendering it poor and crippled, it is all the more important to be patient and enduring. Whether the lawsuit is lost or won, what matters above all is that it must be a triumph for tr Augsburg's principles. Much has all been already been achieved in that direction. More clearly and decidedly than before, through this legal contest, it has come forth that Augsburg has a unique view of pastoral education, that it has been built up during an unrelenting struggle for that very cause, and that whoever may achieve the legal right to exercise control over the seminary and its property, it is now clear to both friend and foe that Augsburg and its property can only rightly be administered when its spiritual orientation and views are followed. The present trouble has therefore not been without its significance. How much guilt may, under every circumstances, rest upon those who are carrying on the work of persecution in the church, this consequence of persecution is nevertheless unavoidable. It always serves to arouse powerfully the question of why those who are persecuted prefer suffering persecution to enjoying the benefits that those in power have to offer. And therefore that issue for which the persecuted suffer is displayed in a clear light. Thus has it gone here. Through cries and alarms, through the dust clouds and confusion of battle, there stand more clearly than ever for public knowledge the principles of Augsburg and its holy calling among our church and our people. Therefore, endurance in suffering and in work is required precisely now. If it succeeds in standing fast and unshakable, holding out without bitterness and demoralization, then through these difficulties, the cause will gradually gain favor in the hearts of the people, and the fires of persecution will become a shining light upon the whole task which God gave our seminary. And gradually it will grow clearer in the consciousness of the congregations that only he is rightly educated for the pastorate, who through the Holy Spirit has become a follower of Christ in faith and love in work and suffering for the salvation of souls and the upbuilding of the congregation. Augsburg Seminary has aroused such obvious interest and has made such impressive progress since it fell entirely into the hands of its friends that it is in great need of expansion and improvements. It may obviously be assumed, however, that so long as the legal case continues, there can be no question of the construction of new buildings, however sorely they may be needed. The old buildings are both too small and too shabby for the expanded labor which is now being carried on. What is needed now, in the unanimous opinion of all the instructors, is a building for classrooms, a library, and offices, where the work of teaching could be done all day long, if necessary without disturbing those who use the time for reading in the rooms. As things are arranged now, it is often very difficult to find a regular time for such activities as are not easily incorporated into the practical class schedule. For example, instruction in singing and music. To such construction work, the legal case is obviously an unavoidable hindrance. And I am not entirely sure whether its purpose is not to hinder the seminary's progress as much as possible. But perhaps more necessary than the extension of our buildings is some increase in our faculty strength. All the instructors are working up to, and in some cases beyond, their capacities. But nevertheless, a small increase in faculty strength will, all the more, will be all the more fruitful. In the theological division, progress must continue in instruction in English and New Testament Greek. We need more instruction in singing throughout the school. And finally, we now need the people to be sent as missionaries to Madagascar to learn as much French as possible before they are sent out. A sojourn in France is almost a requirement for every Madagascar missionary now. And the more one has learned French in advance, the better and cheaper that sojourn will be. 
This past school year has been rich in both joys and sorrows, and for a certainly, and for a certainty, both of those have brought blessing to the school and its friends. On the one hand, there has been a larger number of students than ever before in the school's history, with much spirit and life among them. Their steady labor and regular diligence have been an encouragement to us all. On the other hand, a good deal of illness among the students has brought us sorrow, while the legal case which the United Church has brought against the seminary has taken up both time, resources, and money from the school. In terms of the school's welfare, the year has been auspicious on the whole. Although it has been more than usually difficult in outward matters, we nevertheless have bright hope and much grace to be thankful for. I usually ask for some questions. I realize we're, we're running. Where was that presented? What? what? Where was the conference that year? That you, I haven't got a note of that. Okay. It doesn't say, just the annual meeting of the conference. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we wrap up the program for this morning and prepare for the annual meeting. If you haven't paid for lunch or if you want to join or renew your membership today, you can talk to Tim there in the back and he'll tell you how much for each. The lunch is $13 and the membership for a year is $35. There's also some books out there as you probably saw on the table, some duplicates from the archives and some Bibles and stuff. You'll especially feel free to take some of those Bibles if that interests you. There's a whole bunch of them. And then we just got this year some more of the maroon boxes to put the journals in on your shelf. <laughs> if you've been collecting them all, you probably run out of space in your box, like I did, which is why we ordered some more. So those are $15 if you wanted one of those today. I want to thank all of you for coming and being part of this today, and especially thank you to Dr. Kwanbeck for sharing with us. Let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you are pleased to work through your entire body on earth, your congregation, so that whether any one of us is an eye or a hand or a nose or a foot or whatever we may be in your body, you have work for us to do, good and honorable work, so that there may be nothing lacking in the body. And we ask that your body, namely your congregation here on earth, would continue in its work and grow and prosper, even through suffering, that we would be ever mindful of you, our dear Savior, and walk with you all the way. Thank you for the gifts that you have given to your congregation in the past, in previous generations, for Brorson, for Haugi, for Sverigrup, for many, many who have gone before us, here in Norway, in Madagascar, in Israel, and all over the earth where your name is proclaimed. We pray that you would make us faithful stewards of your gospel in our time and place. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We'll take about